you one, we welcome you this morning to study of God's Word. I never cease to be amazed at how when a church is committed to teaching the Word of God in what we call an expository way or in a verse-by-verse, sometimes word-by-word way, I never cease to be amazed at how God orchestrates the timing of the messages. And I really mean that. Um, There have been times all through my ministry in the last 20 years that when we systematically pursue God's Word, that He, in His his own timely way, speaks to our hearts. He speaks to us individually, and He speaks to us collectively as a body. And I believe that you're going to see that this morning in the passage that we come to right now, both for some of your hearts individually, as just individuals, man, this this message is going to hit you um, in a very strong way, and then I think as a body and as a, as a collective, as we look at the Word of God um, as our present culture is experiencing some of the things that we're experiencing worldwide and here in America, I believe that you're going to say, wow, look at God's timing for us. Do you have your Bible? Take it and turn with me to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. I almost said the book of John. And um, I didn't, for those of you who have been around for a while, you know that we studied John for three years, practically, and now we're in the study of James. And uh, this morning, I invite you to go to James chapter 1, and I want you to see what God has been doing. Let's review for just a moment. If you have a pen, go ahead and look. The title of the message is The Test of Hearing and Doing. Um, As we look at the book of James, we remember that James um, is written by a pastor, He's a pastor in the church in, do you remember what city? In Jerusalem, that's right. So this is the first letter written to any church or any individual in the New Testament. If you look at chronologically speaking, Jesus rose from the dead, he commissioned his disciples, he ascended to heaven, the Holy Spirit came, and the church began to grow. As the church began to grow, There needed to be instructions, and so God inspired church leaders, men of God, the apostles, to write his words for the churches. That's where we get our New Testament. The first of those letters, the first document written and distributed among the early church is this letter that we're studying. Straight out of the box, these are the things that the church needed to hear in that culture. So notice with me on your outline, Pastor James, and say it out loud, in what city? In Jerusalem, around the year 45 AD. So this is around 15 years after Jesus ascended back to heaven. He comes and he writes. And what does he write to do? He writes to warn, instruct, and encourage Jewish Christians that are spread around the world. And so they had been distributed, they had been spread out because of persecution, and James, the pastor there at that key church in Jerusalem, realized, wow, there's some things that people aren't getting. There are some things that are creeping back into our early church. There are the old ways of Judaism are coming back in, or the world is attacking the true gospel of Jesus that he's given us. I need to write, and I need to challenge them, and so he does so. And as a Jew, he writes very much from an Old Testament perspective, and so he writes a very wise letter to the early church. He presents, this is the next thing, he presents multiple tests to his readers so they can evaluate to see if their faith is real, saving, genuine faith. He's concerned that there are many that are in their churches that don't really know Jesus. He's concerned that there are people coming to those local synagogues that have now, now, many of them, turned over to be Christ followers, proclaiming Jesus as Messiah, but many of them that are coming, they're still doing a religious duty, but they don't know what it means to truly believe on Christ and to trust in Jesus Christ. 
They're still allowing religion to be the focus instead of a relationship with God. You've heard a few people right here, our new members, express that that is their testimony. One of them, Martha said, I sat in church all my life and then I came to realize just five years ago, I have never truly surrendered my heart and my mind and my life to Christ. You see, sitting in a church will not make you a Christian any more than sitting in a garage will make you a car. The only thing that makes us a Christian is by hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ, that is that Christ died for our sins, and that your only hope is to come and to trust in Him and to follow Him until you see him face to face. That is the gospel. And God is good enough that he promises it's not by anything that you've done, it's by everything that I have done. And if you will simply come and believe upon the gospel, that you can be saved. Now some of you right now, that's never been clear to you, but at this moment, it's clear to you. I want to encourage you, don't let this moment go by without saying, Lord, I surrender to you. Lord, if that's what the gospel is, if that's what the need is, I give to you my life. I believe in my, you can do that even in the midst of this sermon right now. You don't have to wait another moment. You can say, Christ, I see what you have done. Lord, I turn from my sin and I believe upon your sacrifice for me. And the Bible says, those who believe upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ It doesn't say they might be saved. It doesn't say they're put in the running to be saved. It says that they will be saved. And so this is the gospel of Jesus Christ. We trust that God can work in your heart without an emotional, manipulative invitation that seeks to get you to respond to some chill or emotion or contortion of some sort. No, I trust that the gospel is good for those who hear it and believe that they can be saved from their sins. And so I say to you, that's what James is concerned about. James is concerned about very religious people who are not giving their lives to Jesus and following him. They're following in religion, but they're not following in true surrender in relationship with Christ. So he gives some tests. Do you remember what some of those tests are? The first one starts out, and do you have your book, your, your Bible open to James chapter 1? I don't. I need to get there. Sorry. Um, James chapter 1. Look what it says in verse 2. James chapter 1 and verse 2. Here's the first test. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet what? Trials. Various trials. All kinds of trials. The first thing that he starts off with, the first test that he, I mean, it's kind of like the elephant in the room. You know, if God is so great, then why do we have all this pain? If God is so great, why did I get run out of Jerusalem and have to flee with my family for our lives to another foreign land and set up shop here? Why, why do we have these sicknesses? Why, why are the Romans so harsh on us? Why do they oppress us? Why does the world hate us? And now even our own people, the Jewish nation, many of them hate us because now we're following the Messiah. You see, these people had trials. And so James opens the letter by saying, I mean, he, he just deals with the big, huge issue and the big, huge question of, pain and trouble and difficulty and he says look folks this is the gospel are you trusting God are you trusting in him and so he presents multiple tests to his readers so they can evaluate if they have saving faith the fir- saving faith the first trial is the trial of test of, excuse me the first test is the trial of excuse me the first test is the test of what trials and perseverance he says if you're truly a christian you are going to look to god in your pain you're going to look to god in your trouble and this will prove that you know god this will prove that you are walking with god look what he says here not only is there trials uh, and perseverance but there's also as pastor ben preached a couple of weeks ago the test of blame 
the test of blame. And Pastor Ben rightly pointed all the way back to the Garden of Eden when you see Adam and Eve sin and what, what began at that moment. That's right. The finger pointing. You see, those who have truly come to the gospel no longer blame God for their sin. They no longer blame everybody else for their sin. Those who truly come to the gospel see that God is good, he's good all the time, and we are called to stop pointing the finger of blame and accept that he is good all the time. He is righteous and holy when he calls us sinners. And so we come to him and we bring to him all of our sin, we bring to him all of our pain, and we give it to him and we stop making excuses. Pastor James is saying, now look folks, if you really know God, you're going to stop making excuses for yourself, you're going to recognize that he is good, we are not, and that he is gracious and that we can believe upon what he has said and promised. Look at the next part here. I have in verse 18, and 18 is not in the box. It's not our key passage for the next couple of weeks, but I do want you to see verse 18. So you have your Bible open, James chapter 1, and look at verse 18. It's at the end of what Tommy preached last week. And it's a very important verse that has to do with God's sovereignty in our salvation. Throughout the book of James, just like throughout the Bible, we see what we've already sung and what we've studied this morning, even from Ephesians 1, that God is calling men and women, boys and girls, to himself. He is sovereign in our salvation. We hear his voice. We hear the gospel. We respond and believe. This is God's work of salvation. He is the one who took our sins to the cross. He calls us up and makes us holy and righteous as we see here a first fruit of creation. We see that we have been brought from being sinners to an elevated place of being his children. That's very important. See it in verse 18. Look at verse 18. Of his own will, you see this is God sovereign, of his own will he brought us forth by what? The word of truth. This is the gospel of God, the gospel of truth, that God is the one who comes and pays for our sins. By the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. That we go from being out of fellowship with God to being brought into fellowship with God, being made clean and holy. That's what he does for all who come believing. And then he elevates us as his children. And it's not that we're better than anybody else. We're just simply saved by his grace. You can't boast about being saved. I can't boast about being saved. Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 3, Romans chapter 8 makes very, very clear that it is by grace you have been saved, not as a result of works. No one can boast. It is the grace of God. It's by his will. It's by his work. It's by his word. And so we come and we see that the gospel is a gospel of God's tremendous grace. So in light of that, so James in verse 18 has just said, remember, if you're saved, it's because of everything that God did. And he even comes and he makes you a first fruit of his creation. He, some of you said, yeah, I know the church is full of fruits. That's right. Church is full of fruits. First fruits. They've been redeemed. Bunch of, bunch of sinners. Saved by grace. We all look around. No one's better than anyone else. No one. Not the pastor, not Billy Graham, not anybody else. By God's grace, we're all put on the even playing field of those who've truly believed upon Christ. And notice in verse 19 through 25, now, James, and this is on your outline, their response of obedience to the gospel will verify their faith. So the the passage that we're about to read right now and the passage that we're going to hear at least this morning and next, next Sunday, maybe even the Sunday after that, is this passage in the box and the passage that's right here, this next section, 19 through 25, is, is talking about how we can know that we know that we know in a visible way that we have obeyed the gospel, that we have come to believe. Look at verse 19 with me. It is the test of hearing and doing. 
the test of hearing and doing. Look at verse 19. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted what? The implanted word right out there to the side, the gospel, and put under that Jesus. So receive implanted in your heart, God implants it in your heart, receive the gospel, receive the word, receive the Messiah, which is able to save your souls. We're going we're gonna to break that down a little bit more. Look at verse 22. But be doers, circle the word doers, but be doers of what? The word, that's the gospel. Be doers of the gospel, not hearers only deceiving yourselves. Wow. Wow. See, we can deceive ourselves. There's going to be folks that sit in Baptist churches all of their life, 70, 80, 90 years, that are self-deceived. They've never received the gospel. And when they stand before the Lord, they will be guilty of all of their sins without forgiveness because they've never truly become a believer of the word because believers do what the word says jesus said your lips confess me but your hearts are far from me if you love me obey me if you love me then keep my commandments is what jesus said when cheryl ann and andrea were small children we used to ask them all the time um how do we show jesus that we love him and they would say i don't know and we would say, can we hug him? No, we can't really hug him. Can we come and bring him a drink of water? Can we come and bring him um, uh, something that he need, would like to eat? Can we, can we do something like that in a physical way toward Jesus? And, and we said, no. The way that we show Jesus that we love him is to obey him. And when we obey what he said to do, and when we serve what he would come to say is the people around us, then we are serving him. Then we are loving him. Then we are hugging him. It all fits together, and not just in a warm, fuzzy way. It, it's not meant to be a, a mushy, feel-good theology. No, it's a very real application of the true love of God that we are called to see and hear be transformed by him, and if we are transformed by him, then we're going to do what he said. Notice here, this is what he is saying. Verse 22, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Look at verse 23. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who, intently, who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. Verse 25. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in what he's doing. We're going to look at that second section next Sunday. But this morning, we look at this top one where he, he begins this statement of don't be mere hearers who delude themselves. And one of the key ways that we see this is dealing with a very common problem in the human heart. Notice this and fill it in. God's truth, and what is God's truth? It's the gospel. It's what we call the gospel. Gospel means good news. And it is not only his plan of salvation, but notice in the parentheses here, it is his will and his wisdom for life. So when we talk about the gospel at Sheridan Hills, we are talking about two related things. We're talking, number one, the good news that a Savior has died, and if you believe upon him, that you can be saved from your sin. 
but we're also talking about the whole body of truth. It's the whole body of God's revelation to himself, of himself to us that he calls us to live a certain way. He says, come and learn of me. Come and learn of me and walk with me. Come and learn and see that I am good in all of your seasons of life, no matter how things look, no matter how dark it seems, maybe like the life of Job, but you can come and see that I am good even amidst your pain and even amidst your trouble. Come and learn that I am good and that you can walk with me. That is the whole gospel. It's not only the plan of salvation. There's many people who, who just think, well, I walked down an aisle when I was 19 years old and I gave my life to Jesus back then and, um, you know, I've just kind of, you know, I, I'm just trusting that I, filling out that card and doing everything made me okay with God. Watch out. That sounds religious to me. But if the last time you prayed was months and months and months ago and you, you have no no compulsion to, to continue to walk with God. You need to look on the inside. You need, to, you need to be still and really recognize and evaluate your faith, and that's what James is calling us to do. James is asking us, do we live our faith? Do we truly walk in this way? You see, the gospel truth is made up of words that, he intends, that God intends us to hear and obey. He intends that these words create and make a difference in our lives. Now look at verse 19 with me. It's that first one up there at the box. It says, know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Um, it's very interesting. That little phrase, know this, um, is a, it, it's almost like therefore, it's almost one of those uh, type of usage in the Greek language. It comes from a root that has to do with seeing. And it, really what it's saying here is metaphorically, because you've been saved, verse 18, understand that this is the way it works. Here is the implication. That's what this phrase, know this. So when we come to verse 19, he's saying, know this, see that if you're really saved, it's going to show, and it's going to show in one of the most difficult areas of life, and he brings up this thing called anger. He brings up this issue that really every human being deals with, some more than others, but he, he deals with this very common problem that comes from deep within the human heart. And it has to do with anger. You see, James is saying, if you're really a Christian, you're going you're gonna to see that God is dealing with the deepest issues, the deepest compulsions, and perhaps the deepest flashes of your heart. Notice this. It says, let everyone be quick to hear slow to speak, and slow to what? Anger. Now, I just have a question for you. Is our society generally quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger? No. In fact, let's just kind of say it the opposite of this. Let, it, really, what we are is, we are, <laughs> we are slow to hear, and we are quick to speak, and we are slow, excuse me, and we are quick to anger. We, we live in the opposite end of that. Somebody, somebody told me this week that, um, uh, another pastor told me this week that he came out of the office at their church and he noticed a car over by one of their buildings, and so he just drove over there to see if he could help. There was nobody else around, and he drove over there to see if he could help the guy, and he just pulled up in his car right behind him because the, the windows, the driver windows would be kind of there. The guy had pulled into a parking spot, and this pastor just pulled up and said, hello, uh, can I help you? And the guy instantly emoted with, why are you blocking me in? What are you doing? And this pastor said, whoa, um, I'm, I'm just, do you need any help? And he goes, no, get out of my way. 
the, the, and, and I just thought of this message that I was preparing for. And, I mean, here's a guy, stops in in a church parking lot, the pastor simply pulls up to say, hey, can I help you? And the guy is enraged, explosively enraged. We, we see it all around us. Marcy and I lived in an area of the world where when you went out on the streets, you could always hear someone yelling. I'm not kidding. There was one day that we came home and we said, man, did you notice something today? And, we, and the girls, the girls noticed it. We, we had done some work and done some business in downtown uh, of where we were, and they came back and they said, we didn't hear anybody or see anyone brawling, no one fighting today. And it was really kind of amazing. It was, it was, it was an amazing thing. Um, certainly there are certain cultures, there are certain, um, there are certain ethnicities that, that struggle with that in other parts of the world, perhaps more than we do here in America, but America has its own problems with anger, doesn't it? And, it? and it's not just with certain ethnicities. It has to do with our whole culture and our whole mindset. And this morning, I just want us to recognize that, that James immediately, man, he goes straight to the issue in James chapter, chapter 1, verse 2, when he deals with trials, and then he goes straight to the issue of don't blame God, and then he goes straight to the issue of dealing with our human hearts in some of the most difficult ways. James, I mean, God's word is so amazing. It just deals with the issues of who we are. This is the eternal revelation of God for us. He knows us better than we know ourselves. And if we'll study his word, we'll see that he knows exactly what he's, what he's doing when he instructs us to walk in his will and walk in his ways. So he, he describes for us what a saved person is supposed to do. A saved person is supposed to be quick to hear because a saved person realizes he doesn't know everything. A saved person realizes he doesn't understand everything. And so he needs to listen and learn. That's what a saved person starts to do. And that's, that's part of the wisdom of God working in our hearts, that he opens us up so we can hear the gospel. You see, there's some people, that they don't want to hear the gospel. It's, bah, 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 bah. Don't, you know, don't tell me. I don't want to know this. I don't want to hear what you're saying. Without hearing the gospel, there's no way to be saved. And so God begins to work in our, work, in our hearts. And we see even in this that he implants his word in our hearts. And we begin to respond to him by his grace and by his calling. And so part of that is, is that truly saved people are quick to hear and they're slow to speak and slow to anger. Um, Epictetus said this, and notice what it says. We have two ears and one mouth so we can listen twice as much as we speak. Think about it. You have two ears and one mouth. And the goal is, is that we would listen more than we speak. You see, part of the reason that we get so angry and part of the reason that we may get angry with God or part of the reason that we may get angry with our fellow man is because we're not listening. We're not learning. Because the, the truth of God is words. In its truth, it, it, it's revealed to us in concepts. You, you can't know God just by looking at the trees and looking up at the stars and looking, uh, scuba diving at the beautiful coral reef and looking through the microscope or looking through the telescope. That is not enough. Though that will show you God, it's not enough to let you know what God says and what he wants. And so he's given us his word that we can understand what he wants. Why this issue of anger? Flip your sheet over and just kind of notice here with me. Why this issue of anger? And I've already touched on it. It's because anger is down deep in the human uh, image of God. Um, I want you to recognize this morning that God, we, we see through the scripture that God has a side of anger. We are made in his image and God uh, has made us with a sense of his anger. Now, before you become too self-justified with your anger, you need to understand that the anger of God is very different than the anger of man. In fact, the anger of God will lead you to salvation, but the anger of man will lead you to hell. 
So before you justify when there's a, where the, there's an, a, a thing in your mind or in your heart that isn't right based upon what we're about to say here, just be very, very careful because there's two different kinds of anger. And notice here, and fill this in, anger is our heart's response to a perceived wrong. It is our heart's response to our perceived wrong or something that affects our fleshly nature. It, it, it's kind of like, you know, Smeagol is there and he's got the ring, you remember? And if anybody got near the ring, I mean, do you remember, do you remember how the ring affected Smeagol? I mean, for those of you who are Lord of the Rings fans, I mean, he, he would go from being this nice little creepy guy to being enraged. And who was the one who was the keeper of the ring for a while besides Smeagol? Frodo. Frodo, and even before Frodo, who? Bilbo. Bilbo Baggins, do you remember when they are going to find, and then, do you remember that one scene, and the idea is, is that as soon as somebody reached out concerning the ring, or, and he wanted to take it from Frodo, he wanted to have it again, there was instantly a rage that came out. That's not so unreal from the rage that we have in our hearts when somebody messes with something that we want or something that we think is important to us. We, we can very quickly, from down within our being, perceive it to be a wrong against us. And when there is a, the, the, you see, there's a, there's a righteous anger that has to do with the hatred for injustice. But so often, our understanding of justice is messed up, and, and it's always messed up without Christ. And so we get enraged and we perceive injustice about the wrong things. Instead, we start defending the wants of our heart. We start defending who we are. We start claiming our rights. And as we claim who we are, our desires, our rights, Bill Gothard did great years ago when he started describing one of the, one of the great roots of problems within the human soul is our, is our declaration of our rights. And as Americans, we see rights as very important. And, and, and I don't disagree with the fact that they are. But when you begin to elevate yourself and your rights, certainly over God and over the rights of everybody around you, we begin to deal with a self-centeredness that will take us to hell because we don't understand the selfless love of God that lays down his rights. Jesus laid aside the rights that he had and he left them in heaven, not holding on the, the truth of who he was as, as a thing to be held onto. He humbled himself and became a man. And he died on a cross, even a, de a death, a horrific death, on a cross, giving up those rights, showing us what true love looks like. And so, our sense, our heart's response, typically is very, very wrong. Do you keep your finger in James chapter 1 and take your Bible and turn, this is very easy for you, turn all the way back to Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 1 and 2, what happens? Are you all there? Genesis chapter 1 and 2, what happens? Creation. The institution of not only the physical world, but also marriage. Genesis 1 and 2, marriage is found there. Adam and Eve come together. In Genesis chapter 3, we see the fall. Adam and Eve sin against God. Humanity is taken down into the fall. And then Adam and Eve have children. What are their two sons' names? Cain and Abel. What chapter is that in? Chapter 4. Okay, just uh, those of you that are brand new, just start cluing in here. That's how we do it. Look at Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of my Lord. And again, she bore 
her, bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. Verse 3, in the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock and their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. Look at the middle of verse 5. So Cain was very what? Angry. And his face fell. He went from being happy to sad. Verse 6, And the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry and why has your face fallen? If you do well, have you not been accepted? Will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. It's desire. The sin's desire is for you but you must rule over it. Verse 8, Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother, Abel, and killed him. You see, anger very often comes as we defend the wrong things of our heart. Abel offered up a wrong sacrifice. Abel offered up what he had done, what he had made, God said there is a living, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. There is a coming sacrifice, and all sacrifices are to point to this. Cain was bringing before the Lord what he had done. Abel was simply coming and seeing and offering to the Lord a worthy sacrifice of his first fruits, the one of his flock. God had regard for Abel's, not regard for Cain's. Cain gets angry and kills his brother. You see, anger will take us to it's, it's, it's full point. I mean, this is right at the beginning. These are the first two boys born on the planet. The, the, the only one left standing is a murderer. Truly an amazing commentary on our sinful human hearts without redemption. Look at this. It's from the range of personal annoyance to hurtful expression to violent action. And without trivializing this too badly, I I hope in the next couple of minutes to help you see how we we just have this thing within us. And so I just have to ask you, what are some of your pet peeves? What are some of your pet peeves? Do you have some pet peeves? I mean, what is a pet peeve? A pet peeve, you know, is is something that a particular person finds uh, especially annoying. Does anybody here not have any pet peeves? Does anybody here not have any? Y- y'all don't lie now. <laughs> y'all don't lie. I mean, okay, let's, let's go to driving first, all right? Isn't, isn't that a good one? Don't you find them with driving? What are some of your pet peeves as of this present day and time? Okay, not using the blinker. That's been around for a while, no doubt about it. That's very annoying. Suddenly they come over on you. What, what about... Oh, putting on makeup in the car? That's an easy one for a guy to call out, Jose. Um, you know, what are the, guy, what are the girls, you know, guy, guys do their thing. Too. How about this one? Sitting at the light, the light turns green, and nobody moves. Or there's one person that doesn't move. And then, you know, they pull an Eddie Murphy on you, and suddenly you're sitting there through the next light, Right? I mean, w- w- I mean, what about this? The, the people who don't put on their seatbelts and the thing just goes ding, 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 ding. Oh, she's looking at me. <laughs> I don't know how many times she said, would you just please put on your seatbelt? Don't you hear that? I mean, how about you're sitting there at the light and all of a sudden the whole world starts to move and, and it's shaking at different, it, as someone has pulled up behind you that thinks everybody in the world loves their music. <laughs> Does that drive you nuts? I mean, you start thinking about all the things you could do. <laughs> how about when we move over to the issue of operating in public, you go to the movie, and you sit down at the movie, and what do you hear? Crunch, crunch, crunch. I mean, I got to admit, that's one of mine. 
I, 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 sometimes I have a hard time. The first 15, 20 minutes of the movie, I don't enjoy it a whole lot because all I hear is crunch, 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 crunch. Thankfully, they eat it all. And, you know, then the last part of the movie you can actually enjoy. Other things in public, what, what about people that think that they don't need to wait in line? They, oh, some of you are those people? Oh, <laughs> there's a firing squad right outside t- this afternoon. But I mean, you know, you, you kind of, and, and what about this one where the person just kind of goes walking up there to the line and they're, they're, they're just kind of, you know, looking around and everything. And then when everybody starts yelling, they go, oh, oh, I'm sorry. I, you know, they fake it like they didn't know. You're oblivious, but you're not that oblivious. But you know, and we, we do, we have, we have pet peeves. I mean, I, I think about in technology. Um, how many of you enjoy it when your phone just blows up because somebody has sent you a mass text and everybody in the chain has to comment on it? You know, and the thing just and I mean, and it, and it just goes on and on and on and on. You know, we laugh about these things, but sometimes they, these pet peeves can start to reveal how we deal with anger. The barking dog next door, the, the parent that doesn't discipline their child. I mean, I, I've been amazed in France. You know, one of the reasons France didn't ever really enter the, the EU and accept the whole constitution of the EU is because they still believed in spanking. They still believed, and they said, you're not going to tell us that we can't spank our children. And in French society, it's kind of amazing that, you know, if a child is just having a temper tantrum and, and exploding and everything else, the other people look around at the parent like, aren't you going to do something? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder your kids are so well behaved. That, you know what But those, those things begin to, we, we begin to see how this resides within us. And then we, we can think of either our own personal experiences or we can look at the, around us, at the world around us, and we see that there's a lot of pain that has to do with things that are said. And that there's, there's responses, things that people do, the jockeying that people do in order to get back in vengeance or in either to make something difficult for somebody else, the, the hurts of the past that keep coming out. Or sometimes it's, it goes over into that side of violent action. And I want you to notice on your outline, no, notice here with me that there's several different aspects of this. It ranges from personal annoyance, hurtful expression, and violent action. But, but we need to recognize that the, our culture has an epidemic of anger. And you can't even just say it's American culture. You, you would have to say it's world culture. We, we have nonviolent anger indicators, and that's divorce rates and psychological, medical, educational, sociological problems, massive civil litigation, that's lawsuits distrust, it all winds up to fear and isolation as the anger within us foments and causes disunity. And then there's violent anger indicators. And just notice that domestic violence is is rampant. Street violence, violent crime Road rage, war, oh, this next one, racial strife, where there's injustices, and those injustices are part of our sinful humanity, and that sinful humanity, there's, there's one that is, is unjustly treated, and so there's a rage that comes out, because that, and, and you see some of those are, are correct rages, when there is an injustice, but it's not wrong that you have a sense 
of anger and rage, it, the problem is how you deal with that and what you do with it. And you see, when those without Christ only have one thing to do with their rage, and it's either to stuff it down or to let it out. And so here comes massive problems. Workplace violence, Islamic rage. You know, part of the reason that Islamic jihadism has taken place is because there are many in not only the Arab world, mainly the Arab world, but not only the Arab world, but certainly in the Muslim world, where they, they look at the fact that, you know, 800 years ago, 900 years ago, they had a high status in the world, in science, technology, and in rulership. And now, other than those who lord over them that have access to the great amounts of income that they have in their area of the world, their area of the world is not prosperous, other, prosperous largely other than through petroleum. And so here is this, is, there's this rage that comes out of the Middle East that we are no longer esteemed, we no longer have wealth, we're, we're ruled over by those. They have television, they can see the prosperity of other lands, they can see what's going on around them, and then there's an anger that comes out of that mixed with a great Islamic deception about God that, that completely augments and feeds that rage with an angry God in their minds. And so that brings about a perfect storm to create a jihadism that seeks to rage against the world. And, you know, theirs is not even necessarily about dominance of the world. It's, it's simply about destructive rage. You see, there's, a, there's an anger that comes out when there's perceived injustices or somebody messing with something in our heart and what our want, and without Christ, we cannot deal with it appropriately because we're elevating ourselves. Number two, notice this, godly anger versus manly anger. The word manly, the, the, the idea is humanly. Godly anger versus manly or self-centered, fleshly anger. Righteous anger exalts God's holiness. When you see Jesus get mad and turn over the tables in the temple, it was over the holiness of God and the righteousness of God. When you see God destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, what is it over? It is over the holiness of God being violated by these who flaunt their sin in his face. And when you see the anger kindled against God's own people, it's because they did not recognize his holiness and his goodness. You see, God's the creator. You're not. I'm not. Anger of man exalts man's selfishness. And this is why this very text says, the anger of man does not accomplish the will of God. Number three is elements of the anger of man. It stems from self-centeredness and injustice. You see, there's, there's a validity in it in that there's injustice, and that's because we're sinful people. When you have a bunch of sinful people on a planet that don't want God, that are not living life the way he says to do it, of course there's going to be injustice. Of course that injustice is going to turn to rage. And we see it in every corner of the world. Not only that, but there's a lack of understanding. It's not understanding what God has done. It's not understanding what he wants. It's not understanding the wisdom and the truth of life. It's not using the intellect. That's why we need to be slow to speak. We need to be quick to hear in order to get understanding. How many arguments, how much anger would be averted if people would stop and listen to one another? Even right now in our racial strife in our nation, if we would stop and listen to one another instead of just yelling louder our position. Ultimately, I would say to you, the only real hope for this is Christ. I mean, we're just seeing sinful humanity do its thing. This is what sinful humans do. And it's, and it's not just America, friends. It's not just the Middle East. It's all over the sinful condition of humanity. Look at this. 
element of anger is it has a lack of restraint and self-control. This is what brings about violence that begets violence, hurt that begets hurt, lawsuit that begets lawsuit, abuse that begets more abuse, a child that is abused that grows up and winds up abusing another because there, there's not a, a proper dealing with this anger. You see, the anger of man is not based upon humility. It's based upon pride. And it's lacking in love. God is love. If God was only wrathful and angry against sin, we would have no hope. But because he is a God of love, he forgives our sin and heals our hearts. Now I want you to look at verse 20 with me. Look what it says, and we've already said it, but look what it says, and it's right on your outline that is right there. It says, verse 20, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Let me tell you that your outburst of anger and your hatred that comes out of your heart when there's an injustice, it's never going to accomplish God's purposes. The anger that comes from you is not going to do that. But as we experience the love and the righteousness and the goodness of God, and we see that true injustice is done, not in my perspective, but in God's perspective, there is a right way to deal with that. There is a right way to experience that. There is a right way to live that out. The Bible says, be angry and do not sin. If you go just right out there to the side, Exodus chapter 4. In Exodus chapter 3 and 4, we see that Moses grows up in the house of Pharaoh. He sees that the Jewish slaves in Egypt are being mistreated. He sees a slave beaten and beaten by an Egyptian. And Moses looks around to see. He sees the injustice. He looks around to see if anybody's looking. And he goes over and he kills the Egyptian. And here he is, the adopted son of Pharaoh. He buries him in the sand thinking that no one sees it. He's angry at what, ha at what he saw. And then he buries him in the sand and the next day he sees two of the Jewish slaves getting, not getting along with one another. They're arguing and he says, hey, why are, you, why are you arguing? Why are you hurting your Jewish brother? And the guy just turns around and he, why? Are you going to kill me like you did the Egyptian yesterday? And Moses, boom, takes off for 40 years to the other side of Midian. The anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. God had a plan to deliver the nation of Israel. God had a plan to get those Jews out of Egypt. And it wasn't Moses' way in that. Look at this and fill it in. Wronged, angry humans usually do one of two things. They either stuff it inside or we blast it outside. When there's injustice and there's anger in your heart, right or wrong, and you stuff it down, most of the time you're either a stuffer or you're a blaster. And both of those are dangerous. You can be both in different ways. There's some things that you can stuff and other things that you can blast, but this is not the way of God. Notice here with me, fill it in, neither response is honoring to God or healthy for us. And James is trying to help us deal with that. You see, God calls us to listen to him and to live his truth. He calls us to listen to his truth. He calls us to live his truth. And what James is getting at is, okay, here's another good little test for you guys. How do you deal with anger? Do you just explode? Do you just declare your rights? Do you just declare your injustice? Do you just declare your injuries and, and lash out? Or do you come before God and bring to him the injustices toward your heart? Or perhaps, do you filter your heart to see 
is this my selfish heart reacting? Because usually that is the problem. Fill this in. First, we see in verses 2 through 4, we're called not to be anxious about our trials. Secondly, we see in verses 19 through 20, don't be angry when you're wronged. The real test of your salvation is, are are you living as a God-controlled, transformed human being? Look at verse 21. It's at the bottom of your outline. Therefore, here it is, here's the instruction. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness. And what? What does it say there underlined? Receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to do what? Save your soul. This is the grace of God. That you don't have to live like the world. You don't have to blow up like the world. You don't have to lash out like the world. You can can come and you can take all of of your sins and you can give them to Jesus and you can take all of the injury that you have and give it to Jesus and you you come to, to live in faith to him, in humility with him, not enduring the rage of the world. It means that the world can rage against you and you love them back. Fill this in. Become broken. That's where we get the put away that's underlined up there. Become broken to sin and self. You you no longer stiff-necked proud, but you're broken to God. And you become open. You receive with meekness his truth. If you're unwilling to be broken and you're not open to his truth and to receive it, you cannot be saved. But if you will be broken as your Savior was broken, there was no injustice ever done greater than to the injustice that was done to Jesus. But Jesus, the holy creator God of all the universe gave his life to be broken for you and for me and we are called to follow in his footsteps and James is telling us number one you can do it if you're in Christ number two if you can't do it you're likely not in Christ may we allow God's word to find its mark in our hearts today would you pray with me